So you mean yeah. like talking about how you are when you're at your worst or like at yeah. your toughest to or, be around? Yeah, or? or like, so for example, some people when they're tired, <clears throat> they are the worst people ever. Some people they're tired, they're quiet and you know, mm. but some people they're just tough and then you might not understand. Oh, so he, he maybe just had a bad day and, and he's tired. So it's bad if I don't say anything. But yeah. if you don't know, you might be like, what's going on? What, t talk to me. And, and sometimes when someone's <laughs> tired, you don't want to be bugging yeah. them like that. Like the last thing yeah. they want to do is talk about it. But some people might be yeah. that style of like, yeah. please ask how I am. And I, you know, like I just found it yeah. interesting, like the approach, because we do have the thing of like skipping some important topics. Yeah. You know? yeah. 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 No, definitely. Holding space, bro. Holding space. Holding yeah. space. Because you yeah. guys have three kids. Yeah, we have three kids and obviously the two businesses and it's tough honestly i'm yeah tough tough <laughs> yeah if anyone told us like a few oh let's say before covid hey this is what it's like to have kids and put business with it you probably wouldn't do it <laughs> right. yeah tell us the businesses bro um oh so coastal kids was something that we derived out of my passion i had for the moana and then something that like i just had so much oh, I just want to be in the morning. I just want to show everyone what's up. But I didn't. And then to, once I met my partner, she was like that driving force behind me. Like, we're starting it. We're doing it. We're doing this. We're doing that. And whenever I talked about something, she was like, we're doing this. We're doing that. Okay? You can't just keep talking about it. We've got to do it. <laughs> so, yeah. But Coast Kids, um, it's, it's our lifestyle. And it was one thing that when we started it, we all we wanted to do was share a lifestyle that everyone could do, but through our platform. So like watch it through our Facebook, watch it for our, our Instagram, and everyone could connect on different, you know, different ways. Like guys in big cities that never get to do it, they now get to live it through our, our, our lens. And um, yeah, Coast Kids just started to evolve from there. And yep. my partner's background is in fashion, so she made a whole lot of ponchos, those sold out in like no time. It was like, whoa, what the heck? I can't believe this just happened. I remember sitting there and I've still got the video watching our Shopify and it was like, ping, first sale. And I was like, oh, my God, with my brother and my sister-in-law just going <laughs> mental in the sitting room like, we just made our first sale, like nearly crying. And but it was so awesome. And then, yeah, Coasty Kids just, I guess, just the lens of our life and the lifestyle that we like to live. And other people like to live through, well, not live through us, but like love to be able to spend that time seeing what we do yep. and then one day be able to do that themselves with their family and their kids. So, so there's the clothing side of it and there's also the, the content creation side of it that you guys put videos out or there's also like blogs. And yeah, things. yeah, it's more blogs and then lives. Lives yeah. is where we get a lot of interaction. We, you know, people tell us, oh, hey, eat this. And you're like, oh, you're sweet or... You know, it could be gutting a fish and like, eat the heart. And you're like, okay, sweet. Eat the eyeball. Yeah, sweet. Give it a go. And you just, yeah, it's quite good because it's con uh, create. Oh, what is it called? Like uh, Content? Uh, you know, about? your followers? Follower, you know, the followers can actually control what's happening yeah, in the, yeah, yeah. to a certain degree. They, they feel they feel like they are a part of it. Yeah, yeah, They're yeah. not just watching, but they can also interact with you. Yeah, yeah. And the interaction part is pretty cool. It's sort of like a podcast, you know, yeah. like. If you can see live comments and then start talking about it, it's, it's another epic way of doing podcasts, but we're just doing it through Facebooks and TikToks and Instagram and, but and, yeah. And I guess that's something special about, as you were saying, the respect and the passion towards the sea, the Moana. Yeah. Um, so a big thing, we had a couple of chats about that before on like not wasting, you know, understanding that the, the kai that you get, yeah, you can maximize it. Yeah. There's a big, there's a big one for you. Eh? Oh, huge. Like, um, when it comes to cooking our kaimana, like, honestly, we utilize nearly everything. Like the bones are boiled down or, you know, I'm eating fish heads and eyeballs. That's probably my favorite part of it. Ika is like just eating the head. Oh, I can sit there and eat like four kingfish, huck, or, you know, the, the heads, they could be huge or, but yeah, that's my favorite part of the fish. And like, I How see- How do you cook it? Do you cook it? Boil it. Boil it. <laughs> Just boil it. There's nothing fancy to it, bit of salt, maybe some onions, but boil it up. Um, other times you'd maybe chuck it in the oven and flatten it down and <laughs> yeah, it's it's nice. I, I, it's the best, but utilizing every part of all the kaimana that we use, like yeah. I've even lately started getting into like everything inside the kinner, just like oh, eating it all, the guts and all. And it's, it's actually, 
nicer to me now, not eating so much kinna, but when I do eat it, I really like, I appreciate it way more because now I'm eating everything. And then the shell, you know, like we, we don't have gardens right now, but yeah, obviously you want to utilize the shell for that or take it out to go night fishing and try and catch a snapper, which yeah, we have done in the past. It's cool. Do you go for all the parts, Sean? Nah, <laughs> no, I don't. I could definitely um, take a leaf out of Dion's book. Yeah. I, I, I think <clears throat> like growing up here, I've been quite um, spoiled, mm. you know, like I've had a father and, and um, friends that have taught me how to get fish and, and I've never really felt like I had to use all the fish. You know, yeah. you'd fill it and you'd throw yeah. a frame yeah, yeah, away, yeah. which was what I reckon probably 95% of our yeah. population do, as mm. I think that's the only good bit. And there's a, a lot to learn about what can be used on a fish. Yeah. That's um, it's cool. Like, I've, I've done it. I've, yeah. I've used all of a fish plenty of times, but for the majority of the time, I still just take the fillets. And yeah. Different for bigger fish, like the haku that um, Dion's talking about, like kingfish, the... The bigger the fish often does end up with you using more and more yeah. of a fish. You know, yeah. a kingfish is known for keeping the, the wings and the head yeah. and smoking them and things like that. So you do ge uh, generally do that. But smaller smaller the fish, the less you're really going to get yeah. out of it. So it's a lot of time to deal with. Yeah. Do, you, do you, because you obviously talk a lot about Maori culture and how, you know, that, that connects with everything that you do and who you are, mm. do you also tap into like history? Do you, have you read it or are you interested in learning those stories of like, oh, the tribes, like, because I was watching, a, there's a show that Taylor and I watch from a Brazilian guy and he talks about the tribes in Brazil, like tribes would deal differently with who in the tribe eats what parts mm. of the animals, yeah. you know, like, and you might save the, the brain or whatever to, to achieve, you know, like something like that. And yeah, do you tap into that? Uh, do you know anything? I, I sort of. When you talk about history, um, I'd more talk about like, so different hapu or different area. We have this thing called tikanga and different parts of Aotearoa, you're going to find tikanga changes. Um, we all have the base, you know, a base tikanga, you chuck your, or you throw your first catch back to Tangaroa, you know, show thanks. And, um, you know, we've got stuff on the coast where I'm from, like you never turn your back to the waves or eat kaimoana while your divers in the water or, um, you know, and there's, there's all these little, these this tikanga that you can take as a base that when you go into other areas, other hapu areas like here, I'm not familiar with all the, the tikanga that they hold here, but yeah. I'll definitely practice my tikanga here until I actually know what's going on in, in this in this area, yes. um, until I'm more familiar with what, what they do here. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd call, like, that would be sort of the history that I... Um, concentrate on so that's um, that's passed down through generations um, yeah that's that's as far as my history goes but definitely stories like when it comes to um, different hapu areas like a good scenario is back on the East Cape um, there's a place in oh where's it East Cape um, like Waiho Bay Farikaika Oh, probably not Furikaika, but like Waiho Bay area is really, they've got a story about you can't eat the blue mookie. There's um, certain times of the year you can eat it. You can't catch it by line. I think Wahine yeah. can't even eat it. But yeah, there's there's stuff like that that like I'm still to learn in different hapu areas. So yeah, I I definitely, if I hear stories like that, I'm like, okay, don't touch it there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, stay away from it. <laughs> it's yeah. so beautiful, eh? It's so yeah. rich. Yeah. History, like, you know, every area we will bring so much to you. Yeah, you know, like it's it's endless how much you can learn. Oh, it is, it is, and I know different areas they they come on it differently. So you're just like, okay, yeah, well, that's history in the, in its own. These guys you're following around, you see them on social media, and they're doing different things with their come on. You're like, okay, that's cool. Yeah, we probably don't do that back home, but yeah, I'm gonna give it a go. You know, um, I know up north they love cream with everything. Hey. <laughs> now nah, they they love their cream with everything. <laughs> Yeah, they have cream and flounder. Okay, there's, I don't, I don't think cream was around way back in the day, but <laughs> <laughs> they've adopted the cream. My brothers are from Napuhi, so I've, I'm going to give them a bit of stick for that. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Um, man, so another big part of your life is the commercial kina diver. Did I say it right? Yeah. 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 So I want to talk about that, of course, but like because it's so educational, our show can get educational as well, and people from random ass parts of the world might yeah. be tapping into it. What is a kina? A 
kenna. It's a, a sea urchin, in, in other words. Um, Māori, that's obviously our, our Māori name for, for these prickly, I don't know, you'd be able to chuck a picture up maybe, but yeah. these, these kenna are something that sits on the bottom, eats away at reefs, and if left unchecked, if there's no natural predators, these things just take over um, in certain areas, especially around this area of Coromandel all the way up to the Bay of Islands. But further south you go, um, kinna's not as bad. I guess we've got different populations of Māori, so mm. I feel like we keep them in check on the East Coast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but kinna's definitely one of those. It, I want to take the word invasive away from it. A lot of mm. people say it's invasive, and I feel invasive is a word for something that's introduced to Aotearoa like a possum that's invasive, you know, or invasive plant species that take over. Kinna's just an unchecked species that we've literally overfished in other sectors or, you know, the climate's so perfect here that kinna just reproduce, they feel so comfortable. Um, yeah, and they don't care about their population here. They just carry on breeding and breeding and breeding. <laughs> right. Yeah. Have you got something there, Sean? A kinna story. I'm kinna. <clears throat> nah, I've got a bit of my finger. That's <laughs> <laughs> story. Yeah, they're really good for bringing in fish. Like, yeah. Um, oh yeah, you know, definitely. You could smash up a whole lot of canna, and that'll bring in a lot of species that you're after when you're spear fishing or gathering kaimana. So, um, yeah, as much as they're probably cherished for some people, I use them as burly. Or a lot of people <laughs> use them as burly. I'm sure yeah. Dion does too. Oh yeah, in yeah. a lot of the areas here, you can just use them as burly because some of them just never get fat either. You just like well. There's no seaweed here. This thing's never ever going to get fat, so we may as well use it for something else. Yeah. yeah. So, so how <coughs> does it become a problem? Like, so especially like, let's talk about this area because oh, actually, you 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 don't do it here, right? M yeah, I I like contract to other kinna divers mm -hmm. um, or another kinna outfit. Um, but yeah, if left unchecked here, like you just see m massive. Like what do you kinna barons? Kin, yeah, the kinna barons are out at the gate. Like people back home would dream of what I see here. You know, you swim twenty meters off the Kua Tony Reef, and you know there's big barons everywhere, right from a meter all the way down to like six, seven meters. You just like it's like uh, if you're trying to imagine it, it's like an ocean version of seeing forestry. Mm, you know, when like you drive yeah. along the road and you see forestry and you see like, you know, as much as pines aren't beautiful, yeah. but you see pine trees yeah. and stuff all thing and then suddenly they're just all cut down and there's that sort of waste and it's just yep. bare and it's that sort of yeah. light brown colour. You go into the water and you see, you know, a whole lot of seaweed and heaps of kelp and biodiversity and all that. And then, you know, over years and years, you the kinder will take over and then all you get is the rock. Like it's like... You know, it's like his White head, rock. You know, it's, like Taylor's, <laughs> it's like Taylor's head now. Like Gandhi. It's just nothing. <laughs> right, right, right. So, but kinna. Yeah. But kinna. Yeah. So the work that you guys do, like how is the care for sustainability? Like how does it work for you guys? Because I guess the word commercial and the word game <laughs> fishing, you know, like it's always yeah. the, the yeah. tricky yeah. thing. You know, people don't even understand what's going on, but like yeah. as soon as you say it, commercial, it's like, oh, fuck. Yeah. So wh what is the industry all about? Because in one of the write-ups that you sent me, it says that it's like a half billion dollar industry. Oh, or something yeah. Like that. I was like, whoa, oh, what? Probably plus, you know, like, and because there's a lot of people that do the kinna, um, a lot of different uh, um, businesses that sell kinna and catch kinna and everything else. But yeah, it depends. We're well, going back to sustainability. It depends on the area that's been fished. Um, you know, you've got areas like um, Picton, you've got areas like Fiordland, Stewart Island, and here, where kinna are quite plentiful. Um, unsure why they're so plentiful in those areas. Um, there's heaps of theories, and I, I don't buy into every single theory, but I, I do see some of the theories. I'm like, maybe that makes sense. Yeah. Um, you know. A lot of nutrients in these areas or they're so comfortable that they'll just keep breeding but then um yeah it always depends on the areas like where i'm from in gisborne or hawks bay you definitely wouldn't take much kinner out of those areas um just because it's sustain like sustainable sustainability wise it would not handle you taking out what the tacc or the total allowable catch in that area is, which is like 80 ton you couldn't take that out of that area it's it'll decimate it and um that's definitely something about sustainability is 
as a diver, you start to look at it and go, okay, so this area can probably handle about a ton, maybe once a year. I won't come back here for another two or three years. And if I do remove canoe, I take like 60%, leave 40% behind. Um, and then that gives future generations to be able to see those places. You know, My kids, if they ever wanted to go commercial canoe diving, they can see it. Or even recreational divers, they can go to the same areas and be like, oh, man, this place is still plentiful. Yeah. But then when you come to Coromandel, you literally, you have to try and take as much as you can wow. to make a dent. Um, you know, in a 400 square metre space, let's say, you could probably remove two and a half tonne and still be so much kinna in that one little area. Like, or you could probably remove like three or four tonne. And honestly, it doesn't take a, it doesn't dent it, which is sad. Um, that's what we mean by unchecked. <laughs> yeah, these kinna, they just take over. So do you think a, a commercial kinna divers, are they, do they consider where they dive based on the stocks of kinna in New Zealand or is it more based on like weather at the time? Um, it's definitely based on stocks around, uh, yeah, around the country. Right. Um, yeah, you wouldn't go dive somewhere like New Plymouth and, and try and expect to get kinna out there or, right. or Hokianga or wherever. They, they just don't have the stocks, whereas like here, Coromandel, <coughs> Um, let's say Marlborough Sounds, maybe parts of the east coast on the South Island and the Fjord and Chathams, you definitely do kinner in those areas. Yeah. Yeah. Um, every other area is pretty much kinner don't thrive in those areas, uh, in the areas that I haven't actually mentioned. And if they do, um, it's best to just probably not commercialise it. Um, we don't need to. Yeah, there's enough areas out there at the moment. Do you think there's a need to bring down the amount of kinner that there are here? There is a huge need, yeah. As you would know, like you just walk the rock pools with your kids, and you're just like, wow, there's kinna like everywhere. And a lot of those kinna don't grow very big, you know, like the golf ball size, and they mm. stay that size for like six, seven years, and then wow. die off or get eaten by maybe nothing. <laughs> they just die. Um, but yeah, I think yeah, they're definitely something that we need to figure out the plan going ahead to actually save our ecosystem here because as soon as kinna take over the biodiversity has gone yeah fish yeah. disappear coda disappear you know like nothing well you might find the odd one but they're not no, going to they're sure. not going to sit there in an empty barren that's literally eating the habitat yeah what's yeah. stopping kinna going into the marine reserve and like you know obviously there are kinna in there but imagine a kinna barren suddenly forming and the yeah. spot where there's all these tour businesses. Yeah. You know, take people snorkeling. Wow. Diving, you know? Yeah. But well, there's an interesting, I've got a friend, Toddy, who's, um, he, he, he's a kinder diver as well. And he did this video, showed me a little while ago. And this video is him um, in an area where they dived on this island next to a marine reserve. And they took kinder out, kept taking kinder out to us at a healthy number to sustain itself and keep biodiversity there. And then, he got the video, him right on the boundary of the marine reserve, swam in, obviously he's not allowed to touch the kinna, but swam in and the biodiversity's gone. The kinna's just wiped out seaweed and, you know, fish life are not as abundant as the area that they've been keeping under, you know, keeping under wraps for the last yeah. however many years. Interesting. Yeah. So I'm not saying, I'm not against marine reserves, but I think they just need them, like, they actually need someone to, bring out more data on it before they start saying no take for everything right yeah start actually like going into <clears> these places and checking them out every year and being like okay well that's not working overwhelming it yeah yeah, yeah. Mm. it's like um you know back in gizzy we've got there's not much marine reserves along the east coast right down to wellington um it's pretty sad but back in gizzy that marine reserve i think about five years ago healthy years but i think now like you got coda or crayfish just overrunning that place there's so much crayfish there that you're just like it's going to start eating all the power the, the kinna um you know you start seeing stuff disappear if the coda just take over yeah we don't have i don't oh we do have a lot of sharks so i think sharks are some of their main predators there but other than that it's humans <laughs> i was gonna ask um do, how much do you think access <coughs> affects that though uh, like for, for coda and, and their increase there like yeah. I know when I first met you years ago, your big push was teaching the community about diving. Yeah, yeah. About, like, you know, the amount of deaths with particularly Māori families that would yeah. go to get 
yeah. a kai from the ocean yeah and that resulting in drowning due to like lack of education or yeah. understanding mm. how to dive yeah anyway you know if, if that's the case then there's less people actually diving yeah. for coda and yeah. therefore less coda being taken in that effect on you know for here we've got the access it's it's beautiful white sandy yeah. beaches it brings all these people here then that yeah. have a bigger impact on coda right yeah and and oh i'd say definitely um access is a huge one um there's not very many days you get nice on a weekend because usually the weekdays are perfect and the weekend mm. big big storm comes through but because he's <laughs> If you don't have a boat and you don't have access to the moana, um, it's pretty hard to go out there and go get your own coda or any type of kai moana. Um, yeah, it's susceptible to the environment, well, the weather, and then also the sediment. I don't know what the coda are up to now. It could be, honestly, it could be decimated, it could be gone. Who knows? But, um, yeah, since the cyclones, we've definitely seen... Um, the sedimentary deposits in that area mm. it's starting to take effect on the marine right. life yeah can you um can you tell us more about because that what interests me when, yeah. when i first met you was that whole concept of of educating other people especially the young people about yeah. you know the yeah. ocean and skills those simple skills that will that are life skills yeah. that are going to teach them something that will sustain them for life and yeah. their families eventually as they have families like, yeah hard. has that did you get any traction with that is that something that you're still passionate about yeah um at the moment i've got so much going on um i've, I've veered away from there i i don't know mentally if i can um handle um any more of that right now i'm not going to say not forever yeah. um but it was, it's definitely something i was passionate about when i left down south to come up north um, from commercial diving down there, I come up north and I was like, I think the first headline I saw as I was flying back was like a death from a diver on the east coast, and I was just like, kidding. And I just Google searched and I was like, how many dive-related deaths are there on the east coast? And it just the numbers were just climbing. And then since COVID, like as soon as the 2019 lockdown and all mm. of that, um, I think people were struggling financially um, and struggling with connection. So Māori, I feel like let's say 60% of Māori, their connection to something is through the tile, which is the environment. Um, and the moana being a huge part of that, you know, that connection to the environment, um, Māori started going out. There was more and more, like I was getting messages like, hey, bro, um, what do you reckon, what suit should I wear or how should I start or can you take me out? And there were so many, it was just overwhelming how many messages I was getting. I was just sitting there like, well, we need to do something about this, mm. and then um, I think it was one more death on the east coast, and I was just like, no, nah, we need to we need to change things up. And at the time, I was just working in the grey area. I wasn't a free dive instructor. I was just kind of like turning up and like, oh yeah, I'm just teaching people, yeah. you know, sort of in the grey area. I can't teach you to pass three meters, and um, it was all these you know regulations yep. and safety things as well. Um, but yeah, some of our dive trainings would like pack out like 40, 50 people and you're like, oh, this is way too many people. This is getting a bit overwhelming. Then you have the newspaper turn up and you're like, I can't believe this is happening. Like, mm -hmm. This was only just for me to try and help adults yep. to help their kids and then stop their misinformation or whatever's going on. It comes with a big responsibility, man. Oh, yeah, it does. It, it does. Out. You know, like you sit there sometimes and you're like, I hope I've shown them enough that they can now understand the importance of the gear they're using or, you know, the importance of safety or, like, just don't wear your gumboots in the morning, you know? <laughs> yeah, like, oh, and I was I was a big one of those, you know, like I'd wear my gumboots and wear a jersey just to keep warm and you're out there and you're just gathering kai. And, um, but now I know, like, you know, there's certain things that you're just like, well, we need to actually start moving on from that and um, start incorporating a lot of safety into, especially yeah. our tamariki, because they're the ones coming through. Yep. Mm -hmm. If we start there, then they go back to their parents, start questioning us as the parents. You know, the parents are going to be questioned about, hey, uh, Dion showed us this. I don't know. And then, yeah. but I always tell them like, whenever I teach kids, I'm like, hey, you take what you want from me. Um, when it comes to safety, take everything. But any tips and stuff, take them with you, suggest them, keep them with you. But don't push it on to your, your parents, you know, like mm. um, that's something that they have to grow and come to terms with and actually be like, oh, my kid's actually got a point there. 
Um, you know, a snorkel is a safety device or a mask is uh, important for your face, you know. Um, but, yeah, it's definitely something else. Talking about it now, I feel like the passion's coming back. But, like, <laughs> Good. yeah, as soon as – but as soon as my so head – <laughs> honestly, like, I get out of here, I'm like, oh, I've got a thousand things to do right now. Bro, yeah. what, is, what, is a, what is a normal work day for you? Like, what do you wear? What time are you up? Where do you go? How, how far do you go <sighs> diving and all this stuff? Um, a normal work day for me could be traveling somewhere from 400 to 550, 600 kilometers, you know, and, um, I love being with my family. So I usually drag that out to the last minute I leave. That's usually like if I wanted to be in Macedon or somewhere in Wairarapa by eight at night, I might, I'll probably push it out to like 10, 11 at night and get there because I just want to spend as much time here because mm. I know quality time just before I leave the kids will be happy as and then I can leave my partner be happy too and I know I can leave myself like full my glass full yep. get down there mahi up hard um I think one of the down things is uh, what do you call it like the the negatives of having ADHD is like once you're not around me you don't exist <laughs> And it's, yeah, it's pretty, it's gut-wrenching uh, to my family because once I'm down there, work day is work day, work night is sleep, work day, work night, and it just doesn't stop. And holding space, that's why I've got that yeah. little reminder. And I'm glad we got you. You remembered us. <sighs> yeah, yeah, I know, <laughs> honestly. So every time we've tried to jack this up, we're like, oh, man, I'm going back down south. Or I'm going back down south again. Sorry, sorry. There's so many, probably about three times now. Yeah, we made it though. Yeah, but like, um, yeah, normal work day for me is we get up at five o'clock. Um, we go out, we harvest power or kino or whatever it is. Uh, we're out there for six or seven hours. You know, we don't drink water, we don't eat food. And you just, you put, if, <laughs> I, I was thinking about this before. We put our bodies through things that I've never, you, you wouldn't say human any human in their mm. life would just do that at, let's say, at pack and save, walk around and hold your breath for freaking 20 minutes while trying to work or, or doing stuff like that. And then I, it was probably this year was the first year I lost like six or seven kgs in like a week, a week and a half maybe at the max, six or seven kgs. So I was like, man, this is Weight Watchers, but I don't, I'm getting paid to do this. <laughs> Yeah, like it was crazy. That's the most weight I've lost in a week. Yeah, wow. just through like non-stop diving. How many hours in the water would you spend uh, on a good, <coughs> good day? On a good day, you might do like six, seven hours. Um, and then we've got these watches now. These are amazing. So six or seven hours, maybe an eight-hour day, but like very rare. Oh, you, you probably, oh, we probably do. I don't keep a good track of it, but in a six, seven, eight-hour day. No, we do do eight hours. Um, my watch would read like two hours 34, two hours 40 of breath hold. That's under, what I was thinking. It's under not the very water. natural. Yeah, yeah, so 300 and well, I might do like 365 dives or 400 dives for the day. Oh, no, 400 is a bit over. But 350 is kind of like my, you know, that's up, wow. down, up, down. And well, Ex I think, Excuse my ignorance. When you go down, how many kinners do you bring up with you? Um, well, when it comes to kinna, depending on what area you're in, if you're in this area, geez, you can get like 60, 70, 80 into a bag because they're so small. But when you go down south, like 20, wow, okay. 20 is like a big, wow. big number. <laughs> but you're trying to, <clears throat> you're trying to like not use up your reserves. So when you're diving, you're not diving at your maximum breath hold, like yeah, you're struggling. Calm. You're calm. Yeah, you come, you hook a few kinna. And then you come back up. Um, but when you start getting a bit deeper, it gets a bit harder and you start kicking a bit faster because you're like, oh, I'm a bit deeper I'm today. Deep, yeah. Yeah. And some of, the, some of the guys I dive with at the moment, man, they're just mad. <laughs> yeah, they're like, we, well, we go out in big swell. We go out in like, you know, we're diving like 14 metres for par and kinner. And Are there common complications like for the pressure or things that divers would deal with yeah. that it's common to happen? To, I think to a certain degree, like you mean like scuba divers? Yeah, something like, or even the, the, the free diver, like something with the pressure or like feeling shallow a bit water dizzy blackout. or something. Yeah, blackout. yeah. Are there common things that would happen? Um, shallow water blackout, if we start on that, like. <laughs> We've been here for a while. I think, well, no, but I think it's it's really uncommon in the commercial world. Right. Yeah. Um, body's fit. Yeah, you start to become so dive fit that your body's used to right. CO2 
and what was it co2 tolerant you're so co2 tolerant that your body's just like oh i'm okay with nitrogen in my system and yeah. everything else and i think well from my understanding is like there's not much compared to like recreational diving that's not you know commercials working recreationals just having fun there's not much the same between the two like I feel like when I, if I was to compete in a spearfishing competition, not a lot of it will cross over very easily from the commercial world to the recreational world. Maybe a bit of breath hold, some fitness, but you still need to run a shitload for a spearfishing comp. Yeah, it's it's like the classic um, example of sport though. Like you practice something or mm. you do something a shitload your body adapts yeah like it's mm. a classic example yeah. of your your body's amazing what it can adapt to if you do something eight hours a day for months and months and months you're going to expect your breath hold to become a couple minutes yep. and you, you yeah. know so uh, a really important thing to understand there is knowing that you know, he's talking about he's not pushing himself it's, mm. a, it's almost like marathon diving yeah. what he's doing in the day yeah. is, is he's not yeah. pushing himself yeah. to his limit he's just staying relaxed the whole time yeah. You get 30 kind of relax and then come back up, do yeah. another dive, relax and stay relaxed the whole day. Whereas if he pushed he's himself for, for a little words. while, he's going to be knackered, you know? Yeah. yeah. No, However, right. you were part of a show that involved a comp, <laughs> right? Segway. Yeah. Segway. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Oh, what was it? So Sticky, uh, uh, spiky gold. Spiky yeah, gold yeah, yeah. hunters. Yeah, yeah. So that was a different thing. That was like going for it. Or even though in that scenario, you could relax a bit more or there was the pressure of the TV. Oh, like, no, there was heaps of pressure from TV. Like, I remember the first time I jumped on that boat and I was like, they're like, oh, someone's going to film. And I was like, it's weird. Oh, you didn't know. Oh, no, well, like... Kind of. I sort of knew. There, there was talk of it and they're like, oh, they've been talking about this for years. And I was like, oh, okay, sweet ass. They're all good. And then um, we did a few trips and I was green as. It was probably like my third or fourth trip down south. And, oh, yeah, it would have been about fourth. And um, when they started filming, I was just like, this guy was following me around, Sam Wild, following me around with his camera, and I was just like, is he, is he waiting for me to dive? Or, you know, like I'm just looking around like, oh, what am I going to do here? Like, okay, I'm just going to go down. And got no breath because I'm so panicked yeah. that this guy's following me around with a camera. I was like, oh, I've got to get something for him. Get down there and I hooked like, I think the first, they, I didn't even think they put my, my scene on, but... My first filming scene was like three cannon. I was like, <gasps> straight back to the surface, just because I was like, What kind of professional are you guys talking oh about? Oh my goodness, I know, I know. And, and then you start getting used to the camera. I wasn't fully used to the camera because there was a lot of like, it's like deadliest catch. There's a lot of swearing and like in Tikanga, like how I was brought up, like you don't swear around the Moana and you don't disrespect the Moana and all this stuff. And there was like- Film career dog. Yeah, and, yeah, and it was just fighting what I was brought up with, like being Māori and then being on a TV show. It was, wow. it was clashing hard out. So um, I, I was definitely very reserved on the show. I, I, I stuck back in the, but then thinking about it now, I'm like, um, geez, I could have been more talkative or just, you start to regret a few things and you're like, oh, I could have done this and that, but hey. Learning yeah. curves. Yeah, yeah, but the yeah. show was a huge experience, like, um, you know, confidence-wise. And I think the weirdest thing that come out of the show is that I'd walk through, like, and Pack and Save's a good example. That's our demograph. They, Our people roll through Pack and Save, like, yeah. And um, I'd go through a Pack and Save. My partner stopped coming into the Pack and Saves with me. <laughs> Because people come like, oh, Dion, spiky gold. I'm like, whoa, pff, wow, pff, this is crazy. Yeah. Like, everyone knows my name. Everyone's coming up to me. This is crazy. Wow. Making like, fun of the three kinas you caught. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, but they didn't get to see that on <laughs> yeah, the show. Yeah, yeah, they, no, they were, yeah. And I think the weirdest thing for me was that they put, put me on this platform. I never, ever had said I was a good diver. So this was the scary part was they put me on this pedestal that I'd never put myself on. I was on TV. Yeah. Anyone could be on TV. I'm just a normal dude to a certain degree. I, you know, ADHD kind of keeps, yeah. keeps me underwater and keeps me diving, but I'm just another normal dude that works. You know, if you filmed Bob at uh, Timu Timbers and his crane and he had hilarious stuff to say, he'd be entertaining too. And yep. you put him on a pedestal. I think there's this thing that, I, I'd never really understood when we when the show was released was 
how people already had this um, is it preconceived preconceived idea of mm -hmm. the person I was when I when they met me yeah and that was scary because I was like man you've put me on this pedestal that I've never even like I used to go to parties and people were like oh hey um, you think you're a mean diver I was like oh. what wow <laughs> I never once said that mate. <laughs> But yeah, uh, and it's happened on many occasions where I've like people come up and they're like, "Oh man, you," you're like, "Oh man, you 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 think you're a mean diver? Why do you say you're a mean?" I was like, "I've never said never that. Said it, yeah, never yeah. said it once. I'm just here to help you guys. You know, not drown, be safe, and get the kaimana. But yeah, it's definitely an eye opener. The spiky gold was a cool experience, um, and there's a lot of things I'd do differently if it was filmed again. But hey, we'll. It's further on down the track if that's ever a thing again. And I guess it was, uh, what was the name of the, the host, the main guy on the... Dwayne. Dwayne. Yeah. 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 That, that's an OG, eh? There's a, a He's an OG. Yeah. He's like, the reason why I got into kinder diving was because of his dad. I, Herb. Yeah. Herb, Herb was like one of the OGs as well. Same as my dad. My dad was um, out there kinder diving too way back in like seven late 70s oh, into the man, 80s. Cool. But that was like the cowboy days, you know, they jump on a dinghy and mm -hmm. go and get to a ton for the day and bring it in on this dinghy with a 40 horsepower on the back. But anyway, going back to Dwayne. He is one of those guys where if a guy walked up to my party and said, oh, you think you're a good diver, everyone would be like, he is. He is. Yeah, he's yeah, yeah. the best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's literally <laughs> been the best in New Zealand for years. And he has, yeah. Like, and he's got all the credits to like prove that too. And he's, yeah, yeah. he's someone I definitely looked up to like when I – when I told the boys in Hawke's Bay, I was part of a spearfishing club there. I was like, oh, I'm going to work with Dwayne. They're like, whoa, what the heck? Wow, so I'm cool. like diving next to the best in Aotearoa and Australia at one point. He was like two-time Australian champ. I think they're like wow. seven or 11, seven-time New Zealand yeah, champs. Yeah, him and Julian. And then he just wins it with his son. Or He's just a, another kettle of fish. Like <laughs> That guy has fun playing with sharks. That's a type of... You know, I've seen him down at like... Man, it's crazy. Yeah, 25, 30 yeah. metres off at this rock called Solander. And the seal's racing around him. And he's like, oh, man, this is getting a bit... Must have just thought, oh, this seal's getting a bit like toey. And boom, gives it a bit of a poke. And seal comes off and comes back to him. And poke! Just takes off. And I was like, not only is he down like 25, 30 metres, he's stabbing a seal. And then he just carries <laughs> on swimming. And the seal's like, oh, bugger you, I'm off. And... I'm sitting there like probably like 10. He'd tricked me to say, oh, it's only like 20 metres. And I sat at 10 like, no, I'm not going any further. This is dark and scary. Yeah, but watching that man in the water is, he's definitely not of this planet. He's on the spectrum, definitely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's probably going to hear this too. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. and Jules, yeah. They're, so, out, they're not Jules. normal people. No, they're not. Yeah. No, but that's not. what it takes often to be that good at something. Yeah. Right? Just to be a little bit loopy. I think so, yeah. Uh, th those great two, people. Yeah. Oh, they're definitely Man. great. Yeah, yeah they're, they're definitely good to party with too. Yeah. yeah. So. Like we we'd dove when we were younger and you'd be diving all summer get to the end of the summer, think you're fit and go diving with Jules <laughs> or one of the boys. Yeah. You'd go diving maybe like a minute and you'd, you'd be like, that was a good dive. And he dove and then you know, he dove at the <clears> same time. So diving at the same time going down, you go up, have a breath, get your recovery in, yeah. dive again and then come back up again. <laughs> and then he comes up like yeah. wow. two breath holds of yours and he's still down there like yeah it's ridiculous that, it's really impressive it's and really really cool it's definitely not just breath hold like they've got a fish sense it's different to anything else you'd experience around any other person like mm. they just know you know and you start to feel that you know like when we go when we go diving now you start to see like terrain you're like oh it's good snap of terrain oh yeah yeah but they probably see that but all the fish at once like oh yeah, yeah I think John Dory will be just over there Let's go around this corner. Oh, John Dory. Okay, well, I may as well poke that other one while I'm there. And but again, it goes back to that experience we're talking about. Like that we're talking about breath hold earlier, but it's the bigger picture as well. Like it's that whole environment mm. that they're in. They they've been doing it since yep. they were six or seven together. Yeah. Both yeah. him and Jules. Yeah. Doing it together for that long, so you yeah. kind of expect. You know, if you live half your life in the water, you're probably going to be pretty good in the water. Yeah. Oh, they used to, yeah, course, they used to yeah. tell stories of like kind of diving like five, six, seven, or whatever the ages were. Their dad would just take them out kind of diving. Hey, eh? I was yeah. just like, oh man, that's crazy. Yeah, I remember first ever putting a mask and snorkel on. I was so scared. Yeah, I was scared for years. 
honestly. I was like, every other person that asked the question, oh, what's it like in the waters? There's sharks. And you're yeah. like, mate, I was like that for years. I was just going out because I really wanted a kinner. Yeah. <laughs> I really wanted to eat some power. So I just went out, overcome that fear and just kept doing that. People talk a lot about the, the shark. There's a massive fear, but obviously, are there other animals that like is the terror of, of a diver that you should be mindful? Depending where you are. Depends where you are. In the in Aotearoa, yeah. There's seals down south. I hated them. Do they come like, actually, like what, do they, do they poke you? What, what, yeah, what? they're not your normal, like little seals that you see here, fur seals or whatever you want to call them. They're like big sea lions, like three, four hundred kilo. They're the big buggers that run at you in Dunedin on the beach. Big teeth, yeah, yeah, those yeah, ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. they got big teeth. The canines are like, <laughs> <laughs> and you're just yeah. like, wow, that thing's like biting on my fin or nibbling on my fin. What am I going to do? Like, what are you going to do against a half a ton beast? Yeah, yeah it is different. Eh? Here we have, yeah, like you say, fur seals, and they're like small. They look like kind of, a, we call them sea dogs. Like They look like a puppy dog. Yeah, they do. They're Amazing cute. Amazing the water. You're like, that's yeah. epic. And they come right up to you, and you're like, that's no worry. Yeah. But then down there, eh, they're like oh. sort of sea horses. Like yeah. big buggers. Oh, they are. And then next minute, like, oh, I remember this one time, you had like a female. she just come and did a big shit in front of me. <laughs> Huge shit. It was like cloud of the, all the water. And then this male come in. <laughs> another shit and I was like whoa and then I found out later on that he was being so protective of her because they were about to mate or whatever's oh. going on but I was like this is freaky this thing just like shitted on me like you probably look a lot like a seal though right oh probably honestly in the water, in the water. Suit, like, yeah, yeah 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 the closest animal you look like oh but they they come and check you out like you're some foreign creature mm. you know you're a minion of bloody minions or something they, they definitely know that you're not seal what yeah, about the dolphins? Do they actually there. come and, and play or they don't even bother nah. divers? They just fuck off. They do their thing. I don't know what they do commercially, but I've, oh, sorry, recreationally. But I've had them come in and stuff and it's pretty cool. Like, yeah. It's really cool because you're already ready to dive. Like You can actually spend a bit of time down there with them. Yeah. But um, I don't think they like come and play with you as yeah. much. Nah. Orca are cool. Orca well, that they, they yeah, put the shits them. up, yeah. You can keep them. Yeah, <laughs> but like they've never harmed Where's a human. Where's those whaling shots? No, I'm joking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'd um, I reckon sharks are up there. Yeah. Like, I've tried to think of something that I'd be more scared of. Humans. Humans. They come from Auckland on boats. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, just Auckland. Us a gun for Christmas. <laughs> Speaking of good segues, um, in the boat. we had a chat. Um, at Luke's, shout out, Luke's Kitchen, a couple of weeks ago, um, about the fishing competitions and, and how people operate and, and you know, the hmm. way that different people will approach uh, game fishing oh, yeah, competitions. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And we, we were just having a good... What type of insight do you want on that? <laughs> well, I guess I guess it's, it can be so divisive, but yeah. I feel like avoiding the conversation is the biggest problem. Yeah. If you don't want to listen to someone's opinions, like what's what's the point? You know, because you never know. Yeah. Which there are so many layers to it. Yeah. You know, for the ones who do it, I understand there is a, it's a cultural thing, it's a family thing you've been doing for a long time. Mm. And then if you are against it, some people might go for the environment, so they just have empathy for for fish, but at the same time they they eat a cow. You know, so the, the, there's so many yeah, layers to, to suffering. Like you know, so I just like to. To chat in a non-judgmental yeah. way of like, yeah, well, like how you guys feel about him. I'm a spear fisherman, and every time <clears throat> I put a rod in my hand, um, nothing jumps on the hook. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> I can chuck it into the biggest kahawai workup, and nothing. Honestly, I even foul hook them, and they jump off. I don't know how they do it, but um, my view on, especially like you know, we've just had a big fishing event recently, and I think. It should not be a sport to play with other animals. You know, like, we don't go out there and put a rope onto a deer, strangle it for however long, and then let it go. You know, we don't... I, th I just think it's an unkind way of playing with our, our food. Um, and I, I, I really don't think that a marlin should pretty much give up its whole life coming to the surface, and then eventually you let it go, and it's literally given up itself. Mm. And then mm. some... Some you know sometimes we've seen marlin just floating on the surface because they're like too lazy to bring them back to health and let them swim away, and there's probably some real you know and there is it's like commercial but there's some good people out there that actually got good practices and everything else but that's my view is mm. we should stop playing with the fish, catch it, you know kill it eat it, 
yeah, stop releasing them. You know, it's not a, I don't think, well, you know, that's just my my view on, mm. uh, on fishing comps. Um, you shouldn't be catching 20 kingfish and they keep getting eaten by sharks, you know, or catching them and releasing them. It's just, yeah, it's not an ideal world. That's why I love spearfishing because it's so selective. selective. I jump in, mm. I shoot what I want, I shoot the size I want, I jump out, go home. No bycatch. No yeah. bycatch, yeah. Yeah. We know what we're getting, mm. yeah. But it, I don't know what your view is on, on fishing, fishing comps. Like I don't I'm mind similar. fishing. Like I brought up spear fishing more, yeah, and maybe a little bit of line fishing off the beach, that sort of thing. But never into game fishing or anything like that. Never yeah. been involved with it. It's not been mm. my background. So like you say, like I fully agree. Like some people's family, that's been what they're into yeah. for their mm-hmm. life. Their grandfathers did it, and yeah. so on. They got photos on the wall for years and years and years. And I yeah. can understand and respect that. But like I just think of like a marlin, as or like big fish like that as like those majestic sort of like, yeah. like it's like shooting a rhino yeah like, it's like i've got really close mates that go game fishing and i'm like sweet good on you that's epic yeah. awesome you caught a massive fish that's cool kept it cooked it up that's me that's awesome yeah, yeah but like right. it, i for me personally i'm like i've no interest in going and catching this mm. huge fucking fish mm. yeah because i put that in this realm with like giraffes and rhinos yeah. and these, these <laughs> yeah, big, it's, like really majestic it's animals yeah. I'm like yeah, it's yeah, a yeah, super yeah. majestic fish if yeah. i saw i've never seen one diving mm. and, I, and i've had friends that have had them come in like and just buzz them while they're spearfishing like free diving mm. and i just think that'd be the coolest thing and they said like the color on like a a marlin like a striped oh, marlin lit up and like it was the, one of the most beautiful things mm. i've ever seen yeah. i'd love to see one and that's why i've sort of got it in that zone and yes. I, I would go out and spear it, you know, like there's, yeah. there's definitely something on my on my books that yeah. I want to do. Um, but it oh, is. you can spare a, a, a big one like that. You can go for as big yeah. as. Yeah, you can spare them. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I'm ready just yet. Um, I, Yeah, m- mentally, I don't know what it's going to feel like spearing something so big. You know, like mm. you shoot some big kingies and you're like, oh, this is going to be a ride, you know. But it comes to a marlin, you just, I, I don't know. Yeah, there's not too many you people to tell the story. Marlin. Yeah, yeah. That's what I'm always like, like 50 kilo, yeah, just a little one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everything increases as far as equipment too. Yeah. Like, you're right. not going to go out there with the guns we're shooting yeah. even big kingfish with. Yeah. Like, so, so, sorry, again, like I'm, I'm so ignorant about it, but like, you know, it's worth it asking. So once you, you hit a big animal like that, so what happens? Does, does it run? Like, does it die instantly or, or does it fight for his life and you, and you got to keep what's happening with a big beast that you just spared it depends where you hit it mm. like so g- good spare fishermen take good shots yeah and and there's part of the body that you want to hit or if ideally you hit the spine or the brain and you know even with big kingfish you shoot a 30 kilo kingfish you shoot in the brain you don't get any fight it dies yeah so if you shoot a male in the head you're probably not going to get what you're expecting yeah but yeah you, you, if, if you shoot it in the body like you've got a whirlwind of of a time yeah, coming up, like yeah. hours potentially playing this. Yeah, fish. I think a lot of people um, recently, like people have been asking me, oh, what gear do you use? You know, and if I'm going on a kingy mish, man, I slip tip up because I'm like, I'm not losing that fish. I'm going to rip it to the surface. I don't care about the fight. I'm ripping it to the surface and killing it. You know, yeah. so I just slip tip my. Like if I'm going out to riches right. or something, you know. Well, the amount of sharks now as well. So bro, why not? Yeah. <laughs> I'm getting like the boat boy. Like, oh, get over here. And they're just ripping up this kingfish. I'm like, sweet, man. Do you understand what that is? The rip? Like ripping it up? No. So like when you shoot a fish, generally it's going to take off. It's, in, it's right. you not know, yep. so having a good day. <laughs> it's got a shaft right through it. Um, this is if you don't hit it in the spine or the brain. Mm. It'll take off and then you do what we call playing a fish. So your yeah. spear's attached to a big line depending right. on what gear you've and got. And so you're like, it zooms off, you know, and generally your line's probably 30 meters, depending, yeah. it might be on a reel, like a fishing rod on, on your spear gun itself, or it might be your spear gun is attached to a rope that goes to a float. So the spear, spear fisherman will be at the end of the float and you basically play it, which means this, the kingfish or whatever fish starts doing circles below you. And yeah. then you start pulling it in. Wow. And as it gets tired, it gets closer to you. And then you get your hands on the fish and yeah. you, you dispatch it, it'll kill it. <sighs> Yeah. So that's there's a there's a night and day difference. If you shoot a fish in the <laughs> yeah, brain yeah, 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 and kill yeah. it straight away, you just go and grab it and you're like Yeah, yeah. 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 But then so there's, there's actually some sport and like people also mm. I've heard people that shoot a lot of kingfish they go, Oh, I just stoned it. I didn't get that and they sound like they didn't get the 
what they wanted because a lot of people shoot a kingfish oh, and they got right off of the play. Big play. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. And so I they, understand. Oh, I had a yeah. hell fight, you know, and yeah. so that sort of pays into that marlin fishing as well. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Like I, I, I criticize it as well, but like I, it's been my exercise, especially with the show. It's always trying to look from the perspective of the people who do like that adrenaline peak that yeah. you get from yeah. a battle yeah. you know like it's, it's just like being competitive yeah. with a mate playing anything you know yeah. like that gives you a rush i understand oh definitely you know? I, I i do believe once you start having kids and you start being mindful that you've got a kid at home you're literally just going out there you're going to shoot some fish and you're coming home you're not out there on a piss up yeah you're literally kai gathering boom home it's good and, that you have that mindset, though, that you yeah. you know that you'll put yourself in the other people's mm. shoes because that, yeah. that's the kind of mindset you want everyone to have, right? Yes, because yeah. as, as soon as you start throwing stones, you have to be you have to be able to sit there and say, "I do everything right myself." Yeah. You know, because like, I, I guess it's that good exercise of looking back <clears throat> in in history and understanding that big changes yeah. usually comes with time, yeah. unless it's a massive revolution. But even that, it's, it's a build up thing. So like you. You shouldn't expect all the, the the game fishing people to be like, oh yeah, no, that's right, you know. But if it's a slow process yeah. of of changing how you approach it, you know, like so, I like that element. Like, and at the start, I was much more passionate about it, you know, yeah. because of veganism and all the stuff. And now I'm much more like for the first topic that we were in of the appreciation towards the catch. Yeah, you know. It's not easy to catch an animal. It's not easy to carry one. No. Right? So I respect that so much for the bros who go there. Yeah. Catch it. We had that Shay Williamson. Do you guys know the guy from Int uh, Into Wild? What's the name? Oh, we remember. Big, big uh, YouTube channel. Oh, I do know him. The guy eats lots of possums. Yes. Yeah. yeah he ate oh. possum here yeah. live. Yeah. Yeah. You're he kidding. He ate possum here on the show. Woo, I want to give it a go. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But, yeah. Like, but again, like such a cool Hunter show gatherer, and right? a conversation. Yeah. So... As you guys noticed, and you, as you guys know, we we call you earlier. We have some Kai. We we do the bonding first. You know, we start chatting. That's that's what we do here in the yeah. show. So I called him and I said, "Bro, we're gonna have some 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 pizza." You know, like is that anything that you don't eat? And then he was like, "Bro, it's all good. Like you guys can eat, but I'm on a challenge that I eat everything that I catch for a hundred days." Well, so he brought like this beautiful spreads of flowers. Uh, you know, like he random and wild. Keeping it wild, Shay, shout out, bro, great show. Um, keeping it wild, follow. Keeping it wild, yeah, That's big, cool. big channel. Yeah. He was a trapper, and yeah, he makes some cool things. It's cool, main hunter too. Yep. Yeah. And that was his thing, you know, with the possum. He said something so cool. They're like, and that's the thing. Like sometimes you have a feeling, but you don't know how to put into words. Yeah. And then sometimes you don't engage in the discussion because you just don't want to come across yeah. rude. But he said something that I think of so much. He was like, in the wild, if you see anything rotting, a pig will go and eat it. No mercy. He'll go hard on like maggots and mm. shit. He'll go hard. And people love pork. But I eat possum. That is like one of the leanest. Vegetarian. Cleanest vegetarian. Yeah. And then people think he's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> you just get, holy shit. He's You're got, right. Yeah, yeah it's it, definitely it, right. It, it, yeah. yeah, that's quite cool because... Yeah, you do. You eat pork all the time. I, we've kind of like stopped lately because I'm like, oh man, the stuff, the stuff. You know, it's eating dead horse and. Yeah, you know, a lot of pig hunters literally create pig dumps. <laughs> they, they kill <laughs> maggots everywhere. Like goats and stuff like that. Go dump them just to attract a pig that they're going to shoot yeah. and catch. Yeah. All for it. That's fine. That's yes, great. Yes, it Good is fine. Tactic. Yeah. Yeah. But it's don't hunting. criticize yeah. the guy doing the other hey, thing. Hey, I, yeah. I like that. I like that perspective. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Have you had possum? Nah, neither. Nah, it's one thing I've always looked at as a rodent. So I'm like, oh, I don't know if I want to mm. eat a rodent. But if if there's someone that's experienced in cooking it and you know eating it, then I'll eat it with them. You how was the possum Taylor? Possum. How was how was the flavor? <laughs> Taylor ate it. <laughs> yeah, I definitely. I, yeah. His dog has definitely. So, sorry, Jules. <laughs> sorry, Jules, if you're listening. Taylor had some. <laughs> it was pretty yummy, bro. Was had it like food? chicken? Nah, it was like cow. Like he, he, he what? Yeah, he he marinated and did with uh, possum fat. So he he cooked oh, yeah. it with possum it fat yummy. and onion. Possum fat. So it was like pretty yummy. It was like normal meat, to be honest. Raccoon. But toy oh, toy, raccoon. toy toy was delicious, bro. Toy oh, toy. you want some oh. more of that? Yeah. <laughs> so I just um, that is crazy. Yeah, possum. I'd definitely give that a go. Yeah. yeah but man. under his supervision. Yep. 
<laughs> Definitely. That's what I'm all for, though, too. Like channels like his, educational, yeah. teaching all about our country and like the thing, the way you can live. Mm. That's it's epic. Yeah. Um, and, and you can definitely live off the land here. It's oh man. pretty it's pretty awesome. Like plant wise, even you know, we've got a lot of pests here that we can live off for years. Yeah. Just the berries. He talked a lot about berries and the the nutritional value yeah. of the berries, the wild berries in New Zealand. Mm. You know, but if you don't know Yeah. You go to the supermarkets and you see the same <laughs> amount of fruits and stuff, you, you wouldn't even imagine yeah. how many other nutritional nutritional stuff. Banana nutritional blossom. Stuff. Banana blossom. Banana blossom. We had that tonight. That so we had crazy. a banana blossom curry tonight. That was cool. Yeah. So that's like bananas before they're bananas, eh? It is a good segue, girl, Leo. Talk about her. Yeah. Tanya, yeah. Thanks so much for a lot of love, plant-based cooking. Always bringing amazing Kai to our show. That was interesting. That was a trip, wasn't it? To, to try the banana blossom. Yeah, curry. I was sitting there like, oh, okay. At least give this a go. I've heard about it. But yeah, it was nice. It's funny, you're nervous about banana blossom, but you're just like eight, three week old Kenna or something. Yeah, boy. <laughs> yeah, so but, but see, that's, that's the thing with the exercise of empathy and, and, you know, not projecting your background into someone else. Mm. You know, like in some countries, they eat dogs. Yeah. Are you going to rock up there and, and tell them off? You know, like you're going to yeah. go there and say, hey, what's up? Like, I definitely give everything a try once. You know, and if I like it, then I'll go back. But would you most, try a dog? I'd try a dog. True. Not our pet dogs here, but I'd try. <laughs> I'd try their. Try. <laughs> if they're too annoying. Nah, man, imagine that. Eh? Like just him. <laughs> oh, okay. I've. Oh, like, you imagine just standing at the beach and like, oh, that foxy looks nice. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Well, that lab, yeah, boy, That's he's put on some lab. weight. That's a fat That's lab. A that guy. He's got some hanu on yeah. him. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what he's been eating. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I've definitely tried in other countries that like, uh, yeah, it's like, um, I think everyone gets to try whale in some country and some part of their travels in life. And it's definitely something that's like, if I go visit the Inuit people, we'll be like, oh, can I try some whale? Mm. Yeah, I want to try it once, just like Kiwi and Kiri. No, I'm joking. <laughs> I thought I'd check it out there. What about uh, Monkey insects? Brain. Monkey brain. What? Monkey brain. That's oh, a, that's I a don't. That's a specialty. That's a, how do you call it? Delicacy. Actually, yeah. I eat sheep brain so like. Monkey brain. Where? What was the country that we saw that video that they trapped in? Uh, north, north of China. Man. Tim. Yeah. And actually, they, they used to eat the, with, while the monk was alive, but then yeah. it's not legal anymore. They Fresh. have to kill it. But they used to just open their head yeah. and eat with chopsticks, shit. Oh man, there's mm. there's some savage food channels out there. Mm. I, but a lot to do with the energy as well. A lot to do with with getting. Oh, that, is that what it's about? You know, for 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 the ones who believe in like Cultural believe side. in the oh. yeah, in getting. That's why we were talking about the the indigenous and, and so many tribes that they were cannibals. That it was actually a, a, an honor wow. for the one who got caught to be eaten by the chiefs yeah you know in some in some cultures that would be a thing like there was a whole ritual to 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 sedate them the cooking thing and then yeah. you know it, 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 there was a hierarchy of who would eat what part of the yeah, yeah we yeah. got into that crazy conversation the other day about like cannibalism because i'm i'm i tried the more that I can to open my mind to that because i want to talk to as many people as give it a go i can a human <laughs> a human uh, if you are like in those crazy situations that people always joke if you're in an island and the, the plane crashes oh, I hey know. i joke I'm about it but you know but how many times has it happened could you eat a human like i guess it's one of those questions that you don't know until you're in that spot <laughs> I, I, i don't think i could i, no. I think about like where would you like what cheeks, would you backstage? cheeks cheeks I don't know, but it's their mouth. It's so germy. Go for their mouth. Oh, you kiss the mouth, bro. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe someone with Hanu. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, just like, hey, bro, we're just gonna do life pres life prescription, <laughs> whatever the word is. And just take your Hanu. We're not gonna kill you, all right? Just, oh. I don't know. Far yeah. out. This I country. think there's Papua New Guinea still. What? Got or just or was one of the last ones? 
I to be think I think if, if I'm I don't want to say it like internet but right. like if it's not it's still a thing like he was probably one of the last ones to drop uh eating I, I did watch humans. that reporter that guy was on the river I can't remember I just watched it like not so long ago we were standing on the river and there's this tribe of cannibals sitting there with him and then this cannibal dude gets upset at him Oh, yeah, for so doing yeah, something yeah, you guys yeah, seen got it scared as fuck, he, he got scared because like, they made him wear the teeth up. and stuff yeah. and like the jaw of yeah, all man. these humans and then he was like oh, uh i think i need to leave how, how do i leave like this guy seems like he's gonna kill me and i was like wow that's crazy and there was still being practiced that was color film that wasn't 1930s film that was yeah it felt like the last 20 years at but, least but but again like that's the thing we get too caught up with our lifespan and it's so short compared to <laughs> hey like we were yeah, people yeah. australian were shooting aboriginals less than 100 yeah. years ago yeah in the streets oh right. they're running them over still in road trains <laughs> and like thames not in thames yeah <laughs> not in thames <laughs> yeah it's original yeah but like crazy yeah full on but but again like from our perspective yeah of where we are now and in the culture mm. that we are because for them they will look at the things that we do and find that we are like lunatics yeah checking our phones every five oh, seconds how crazy <laughs> is it i want to flip it uh just before we go too deep in the cannibalism thing <laughs> the business side of things um bro because you're such a calm man and like you have this thing with the sea and taylor and i now you know like running a business and learning the ropes by ourselves you know yeah. doing the putting the mahi in I guess for you and the Demoana was a was a similar journey to just go. Let's go. Let's do yeah, it. Yeah, we started our we started our business a week or two. Or I oh know it was actually a little bit before lockdown. But when we finally started our business, the government were just handing out money to I'm going to call them plebs, just random people who called themselves this and that and mentors and business advisors. And I was like, we we just started our business taking um advice from people who don't know what the fuck they're talking about like and you're just like wow mm. you know the government just wasted nine grand on you to try and do stuff for us and you haven't done anything but wow. it was definitely a tough world and where we started because who do you trust the government were just giving out money to anyone that just called themselves a mentor pretty much um yeah so it was real hard leading into it and we found some good mentors in the end um but it was it's still definitely tough now like mm. there's no blueprint for any one business like mm. you guys have your business there's moving parts that other businesses don't, don't have it. so you can't just go and research it maybe chat gpt can tell you a little a few things but mm -hmm. it's only going to give you as much data as someone else has put in yeah yeah but that business like it's a scary place um mm. And it's a really eye opener to how much small businesses actually, um, oh, what do you call it? Like, give to the economy and and alter it all. Like, you don't even have to be a big business. We pay a shitload of taxes, taxes yeah. um, GST, everything else, and then you get these other businesses <laughs> that literally turn into charities and everything else. I don't want to go too deep down there, but. And they don't pay anything. You're just yep. like, mate. Yeah. We're only on like ninety k a year, and you're bloody millions. Yep. And I'm having to pay like fifteen, thirty percent yep. of that to tax and GST and whatever else. And yep. yeah, and I think it's quite hard in business because you start looking at accountants and you're like, who's the right one that's gonna tell me the right yep. thing? <laughs> and then you start. You ask the accountant, and they give you the straightforward answer like. You just have to blah blah blah, and they stay by the book, man. They yeah. don't give yeah. you much. Yeah. And for, for me, man, being in New Zealand now over ten years, yeah. For probably half of this time, I thought that New Zealand had no had no co co uh, corruption around. You know, like, <laughs> I, I was like, "Fuck, there is no corruption here." You know, like it's, it's just organized. Good. But then when you open the fucking Pandora box, man, it's <laughs> fucking everywhere. Eh? Oh wow. man, yeah. I know. I think it's there's corruption in different countries, but it's the decibel or the level of corruption. You know, like yeah, okay, you go to some countries and the police will hold you to ransom, make you pay them a couple hundred bucks or whatever. But you come to New Zealand, the corruption's on huge levels where you're like, oh, you can't actually do anything about this. You know, especially yeah, I won't go any further. I just go, I just Let's go. go. Oh, Let's you just go, go down big rabbit holes. Hey? <laughs> yeah, we don't want to shut this down. No. <laughs> Do you guys engage though? I think for for Sean, Sean and I, it's always a bit 
trickier with with jo uh, public jobs at the school and everything. So there's there's there are policies to not talk about um, oh, they would some suck. topics. Yeah, you, I, wh what I what I find is that if you can guide someone through that passion of being curious, you mm. are doing a better job than actually throwing yeah shit you know and i'm like if, mm. if if you can inspire someone like to be curious to actually ask mm. what's going on and understand why these things work like this and like that you're not preaching you're just no, teach them to have an open mind because who knows if that's cool right as well, do that. You know? mm. yeah. the, big, the, the word that i use when i'm talking to those kids especially the ones that are just about to leave is just being critical of everything they do like the word critical yeah so to, instead of just being a sheep actually consider why something is the way it is or why something happening oh, the way it is you know <laughs> if i had a teacher like you man i would have been like yeah boy Thanks, man. <laughs> um it's it's important eh? it's a it's again yeah, a life skill like that's the most important thing as you're pushing them out there into the world that where they're thinking for themselves they're not just being a sheep yeah you know can i just ask one thing like do you think it's scary that we don't teach our kids about their emotions as like we don't we are well we're no trying. no but you know like there isn't like because i remember growing up like going through school like there's none of that right. maybe there's a bit of puberty hey you're gonna start feeling this and that and it's like yeah. oh cool but like until i met my partner angry was just angry it didn't stem from anything right sad was just sad happy was just happy yeah never knew mm. just kind of felt the, the the layers yeah. yeah but then when i you know and i always think about it, i'm like man would have you know much better off kids if they knew why they were sad and mm. then break that down you know like i'm learning it as an adult and it's bloody hard learning as an adult is hard yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah but uh, yeah that was all i was wanting for to. sure yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely and and i can tell you like there are, like i teach a little bit of health yeah and ma i'm mainly another topic or subject but it is getting there like cool. the, the things we are mm. teaching them you know it's really cool we're teaching about mental health and vaping oh, yeah, and sick, yeah. things like that and for sure like even our age when we we're at school i remember being at the same very school and men oh not mental health but health lessons were very different oh yeah definitely. you know like it, it is it is getting better but it, it's, it's a really hard thing to teach did you get hey, the pregnancy video yeah was it the yeah. one is the it birthing the video, the condom. Oh no, nah, no, nah, nah, just the birthing okay. one. <laughs> we got the I birthing the video. video. Eh? Oh yeah, nah. but anyway, carry on. So. Oh, it's, it's yeah. I can just reassure you, it's getting better. It, it's just not an easy thing to teach. Yep. Yeah, hey, teaching about easy, emotions yeah. and things because, like that because you need the investment from the kids too, yeah. and that's the hardest thing to get. Once you get the investment, then you you're away you can actually yeah. teach them but you really needed to be like okay yeah i'm keen to learn about this it seems to be one of those things like what what i see often is that um teachers have subjects that because i don't teach full classes i just do the music thing it's quite specific but then i see teachers who are very specific about a subject and the next minute they're teaching something else mm. you know and they, they they get to understand what's going on of, of course they know how to teach yeah. so that's good so they they make sense and they're like cool i'm on a journey of also supporting you guys and there are things that i don't know i love teachers who have that thing yeah of like i don't know at all but hey here's you know let's find out let's do this together but with feelings <laughs> you know like if you're not legit like if you're not actually yeah. you know what i mean like yeah, yeah, it, yeah. it can be the the fakiest is that a word like the the worst thing yeah that you could do is to talk about emotions if you're not yeah. actually aware of how it works with yourself yeah 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 I, I guess yeah that, that would be the hard one is like how are you going to teach us if you don't actually know yourself yeah 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 this is where i have to slow down and not talk too much because it's a hard subject for me yeah i would i wish that you could have a professional that knows mental health teaching mental health to kids yeah. every day you know that'd be the best thing ever is to have yeah. a mental health professional come in and teach them whereas they're stuck with me you know, I've had a great life and I haven't had to deal with too much heavy mental health personally. Mm. And therefore I haven't got this experience or I haven't seen people uh, that have yeah, experienced, you, you know from, what I mean? Yeah. Like yeah. I'd love, yeah. you know, someone that is an expert on sexual education to come yeah. in and teach these kids because I'm no expert. I just know sure. a little bit yeah. or I've been taught a little yeah. bit myself. So that's the biggest shame is that, you know, we don't have the money or the time to, yeah. to have those professionals in every little thing, you know, I'll talk to you for the rest of my life about outdoor education and outdoor yeah, education yeah. and how passionate I am about it. But yeah. health is something that I feel nervous to teach. Yeah, 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 you know, yeah. it's, it's a shame. Staying on the teaching bandwagon, um, 
obviously of I have ADHD and for me to focus on something that you're trying to teach me which I'm not interested in is very difficult mm. and so what I've you know because I, I was running courses and stuff mm. what I found was um, I had adults as well as young teenagers and kids that when I was teaching them the textbook way of how this um, like you know this um, diving these diving experts mm. have told us to teach these people um, yeah how they've showed me to teach them they're not learning so I started doing like visual touch good practical started doing all of the sensory stuff and all of this to get because I was like how would I like to learn minds through practical and touch yeah um, and visual you know like and then as soon as I incorporate all of that, the success rate for these people to absorb the knowledge that I was giving was like, oh. yeah. but I was like thinking, do teachers, do you guys incorporate that, you know, that sort of stuff these days? Yeah, hard to say you guys, like some yeah. people are still textbook, <laughs> which is sad, <laughs> Oh no! but absolutely me, because I, I was one of those people myself oh, as well, yeah. you know, like yeah. I was, I'm terrible at maths to this day yeah. because I was taught textbook way, stay inside. Whereas if I was walked around the yeah. school and like, there's a pole, imagine how much is in there learn the volume, blah, 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 like practical, put my hands on it. I would yeah. have probably learned maths, Yeah, you know, but yeah, yeah, that's definitely, yeah. that's a huge one. That's the best thing you can do. My, mm, the most important thing for me is like building a connection with that kid that's uninterested yeah. with their life already. Yeah. Being like, oh, hey, like, what are you into? Like, get to know the kid, get the relationship. Yeah. Okay, this kid loves spearfishing, yeah. for example. You know, yeah. how am I going to teach them? about safety and stuff like that yeah but then i could connect that with spearfishing and then they might yeah. think in that context so creating a connection that they're comfortable with or interested in yeah then then you get the learning from there just blanket there's a book just doesn't work yeah no it doesn't I, I know and i think the one thing about teaching is especially if they can see an outcome like mm. diving where they can hold their breath and then they start to see progress like oh it's 20 seconds now i'm at a minute mm. now i'm at a minute 45 i'm doing a 25 mm. meter lap on the pool 50. Yeah. they can see their progress in like one day and like i i sort of i hoped in my life that i'd be able to experience that when it comes to um reading books and maths and mm. everything else like i struggled to read to about five six years ago like mm. honestly i look at <laughs> i used to look at like newspapers and stuff and be like Oh, I'll just look at the pictures. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Honestly, I couldn't see the words properly, and mm. I was just like they were jumbled up, or just just. The hard thing, bro, is that make sense in that class though. You've got people that the book work works for. It yeah. does. And that you have to be able to cover all of that. Yeah. You could have thirty kids in a classroom. Yeah. Teachers and you're pets. having to. <laughs> 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 no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Not an easy job, man. Not an easy job. Yeah. Which is so different. The kids are so different. You know, just by having mm. a conversation, oh, just yeah. by starting. Hey, how's it going? I'm like random ass yeah. answers that shows how different they are. You know, are they like, like uh, I feel like they're pot. more advanced now because they get so much more information. Well, or, well, but, I, but common sense may not be there. Sorry, kids. Yeah, they're advanced and, and some awesome things that would make me and you just baffled. Yeah, like technology and things like that. Yeah, you know, like I still struggle to turn the projector on in the class, <laughs> and they'll be able to do that piece of piss. But then you'll teach them to tie a knot. It'll take a long time. Yeah. Or you teach them to shake someone's hand when they come in the room and meet someone or say hello and yeah. look at them when you come in a room. That sort of stuff seems to be stuff that's... Must. Go, yeah. But do you know, like, we're, uh, uh, my mother-in-law, she's in the uh, teaching world. Um, she's been a Tumuaki or um, principal at schools. Um, I remember talking to her a little while ago and she talked about what COVID has done to this generation of kids and then the, the effects we're going to see over the next five to six years mm. from COVID, even longer, 10 years, mm. you know, stuff where like when they, Ripple you know, shaking, yeah. you have to start teaching them to shake hands and, um, you know, gestures. Because they lost talk. that social aspect of life. Yeah, like when right. we talk, we've, even we've worse, got hands. they were told the opposite, yeah. to not do it. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. 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 but yeah. It, and I, even though it was only six, oh, actually it was two years really, you know, two years of their life where they couldn't shake their mate's hand or like, mm. you were germs, you know, like they just, yeah. you imagine we go from fully touch, not, you know, like hugging and touching and handshakes and everything was just normal to like two years of, oh, no, nah, you can't do any of that ever. Yeah. You know, mm. like how crazy mentally it would be for them. And they've got to now go to school and try adapt to this, and yeah, it'd be hard. Yeah, so now they're. I think this is what they're talking about is the effects it's going to start having over the next few years socially for a lot of the kids because we all know Skype is running all through, you know, like the lockdown and mm. stuff like that. 
everyone loves their screens. I, I'm pr- pretty sure we've all got something out of lockdown. We were like, check our phones all the time. Mm. And we yeah. have so many people coming to the show and talking about the bad things about social media, usually all the people, obviously. Yeah. And then I'm like, man, <laughs> by the time you're complaining, the kids are flying, you know, like <laughs> nailing every single bit of, of that technology on their hands. So again, yeah. putting myself in their shoes, there's no point fighting mm. it. It's the same thing with like banning the cell phones at school. I'm, I'm, it's hard for me to, to position myself to say it, it, it's right or wrong to do it. But what I really think yeah, is let that me hear it. <laughs> this, um, uh, it's gonna sound bad, but like laziness in a big massive scale to actually change the educational system because it's one of the oldest ways of doing that is like, say it, what, blah, 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 blah. And technology doesn't stop. So like, because no. you don't want to change the trick, that's why it's so cool when you do like outdoor stuff, because then you, you Textbook breaking, stuff. you're breaking that, you're yeah. taking them out yeah. and you're showing a world to them. That, that's where like, they go. learn in the so, tile. You can learn But because everything. that thing is so powerful yeah. that it distracts them. It's not that it distracts them, in my opinion. It's just like everything around them, does, that doesn't fit, mm. Yeah, you know? So in some countries, they implement yeah. the technology you know, again, not saying that it's right or wrong, but they are at least catching up yeah. with what's going on. Because yeah. what's the point of forbidding something? And then as soon as they leave, the whole market, the whole business area that they have operates oh, on devices and shit. Definitely. And then like, you just told them not to, you know? So builders are using like Bluetooth bloody levels and measurers and you're just like far yeah. out. But for the social aspect, I yeah. must say, it's pretty cool to see them interacting in the field, you know, like in chatting and not having, yeah. you know, that's why I don't put like my opinion, like that's it. But I, I try to see yeah. at, at both. Well, a huge sides. example for us is school, like our school recently gone cell phone free. Yeah. And for I me- I think the whole country's gonna go, eh? Did you hear yeah, Luxon saying? Yeah, yep. Which oh. is awesome. For me, I'm like, I'm very much so like, I'm not anti phones, but I'm anti like useless phone use, if that makes any sense. Yeah, like, yeah. Um, you know, kids on a sunny day sitting in a classroom at lunchtime, having a, you know, just, just texting each other or Looking playing a phone. game for yep. an hour and that's their break. And so <laughs> I've seen in, in like, yep. that was last year, say, and then this year, oh. no phones. And it's so obvious. There's kids out playing like oh, sports out in the field. They're in the gym running around. Are and the like, marble pits not... still a thing? Hey? Are the marble pits still a thing? What? Marble no, pits, you know, no. flicking marbles. We never had marble pits. What? We had in Brazil. Oh, pits. what? what is happening here? You guys are deprived. <laughs> Maybe we need to bring marble pits back. Marble pits are crazy. Like right. Everyone had marbles, like different colours. and Handles pot. thriving. Oh, that's cool. Days, well, like that's another square, old game. Six yeah. square? Yeah, six square. Seems to be a big yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. Shit, yeah. No, but you're right, Sean. You're right, 100%. But then again, like I always go for, for some teachers and subjects, it could have been quite useful. You know, like a device, yeah. an app or, or, or something yeah. that I, I can show you straight away. What, yeah. Same for me with music. Get your phone, you know, like find that, do, 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 mm. let, listen to that, you know, like write it down so you can listen to it later because I was trying to implement the ways that I didn't have. Mm. It was hard for me to learn those songs on the drums because where would I find them? And nowadays they have it. And I'm mm. like, okay, write it down and, and look for it yeah. later. I it's rem- still fine, it's adaptable, but you know what I mean? You probably yeah. fully remember like when you're going onto the music scene, um, when you want to learn a song, you'd have to like push play on the tape cassette, write it down quickly, rewind, back, play, yeah. and then keep writing it. But now you just touch your fingers like, oh, back. there's the lyrics. Yep. Yeah. But like back in the day, it was like, and sometimes someone might record over your whatever tape it is and yep. you're like, you just recorded over my tape. <laughs> Can't believe you did that. And Stu has a good take on that because although it's great, the technology, it makes a lot of kids like they don't care because it's too easy as well. Yeah. You know what I mean? When you have to struggle to find the track and go back to it yeah. and rewind, you're more passionate mm. if it's there all the time. You know, like again, so there's so many layers. Yeah. To the it's a gray area. Like for me, it's like this is a gray area where there's like there's technology and there's awesome, amazing technology and for me, like with kids using it, I'm all for it. But then when it goes into an area where it's just useless use yeah. of technology, like they're just playing a, like a senseless game yeah. Yeah. or like sending the same person like a nothing image. Cyber you see bullying. them like sending yeah. a photo to each other just to keep a streak going and they're not even taking a photo of, it, of themselves. 
like it's them taking a photo of their forehead or like oh, they do. the desk they and do. just to keep a streak going that's like you're getting nothing out of that like just because yeah. your points say you've got 70,000 points yeah well, that's nothing <sighs> it's like there's nothing tangible in yeah. like you know oh. but like if it was someone like being like, oh, you know, I just created this song or I could tell you exactly where I am in the bush right now using this phone or this app. Like, yeah, that's useful yeah. technology. Yeah. So it's that gray yeah. area of being like, what side of the line are you? Yeah. Yes. Do but you guys use it? Do you like in, in, in the commercial? Um, technology. Like, yeah. Is it something that is like it's hands on? And oh, the this is exciting for me to talk about. That's cool. Well, when I first started, oh, when I first started, I come into a space of technology so the way we recorded our fish um, or our catch that was landed on the boat where our boat is all of this stuff um, i didn't have to adapt to a new system just before i started used to be paperwork mm. so they used to have like they didn't have a phone so on this phone right now i could go in there i've just caught 300 kilo of kinna for the day i'll log how much kinna we've got and then my recreational catch i have to log so whatever i catch that's going to be for me to take home log that into the app, the app pings it off the MPI, but at the same time there's another device that's sending your position every 20 minutes, beep, beep, could be every five or whatever, mm. whatever you set it to, but it's a let MPI know exactly where your fishing vessel is, where you're harvesting like from. a safety thing as well, yeah. and, and tracking. In. But the cool thing is, is that I come into this not having to readapt to something else, whereas a lot of these old fishermen, I've heard stories of old fishermen that couldn't adapt couldn't get a tablet on their boat, didn't know how to use this stuff, so they just quit fishing. Wow. Yeah. It's sad, eh? It's sad. Mm -hmm. Like, guys down in Bluff, like, literally gave up their boats and just went, oh, I'm not changing. Hard to keep up. Yeah. 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 It's like, back in the day, they just had this book and wrote down all their catch and estimates and everything else. Um, but, yeah, technology is a huge part of our, like, you know, we use Garmin's or Simrad's or whatever, you know, your, your plotters, you know, your chart plotters. And, and your watch. And this, this is GPS. Like literally, if I find a spot and the vis is bad, I could just quickly put this out of the water, click a button, the GPS is that spot, and then when I want to try find it again, it'll just have a little error. You know, I was like, oh sweet, just follow that. Oh yeah, sweet, dive down here. You know, it tells me the depth, what it, what my heart rate is. These things are crazy. Man. Like I use this a lot when I'm diving hard. Like, you know, oh sweet, I'll try and keep my times at double. Like. If I'm doing 45 seconds down, I'll try and do a minute 45 or a minute 30 um, on the surface to recover, just to keep safe, you know, and keep productive throughout the whole day. And then I, another thing I monitor quite, quite a lot on here is heart rate. Um, at the beginning of the day, I could be my heart rate could be around 54 to 59 beats per minute, and then um, throughout the day, because I don't eat and obviously exercise and everything else, mm -hmm. my heart rate can be up at 130. You know, um, but yeah, I just monitor that throughout the day. If I see that my heart rate at like ten o'clock is already at one hundred and twenty, I'm doing something wrong. Yeah, that's um, pretty amazing, eh? Technologies like that. We had the same yeah. mate of mine, Nico, who was on here with us yeah. together. We bought a yacht together, and the first sale we had was quite gnarly. The very like the first hour or two was bliss. Like we were cruising at eight knots for our yacht. That was really good, and we both had those watches. Oh yeah, and we were like forties, like peace like just going really well <laughs> hour or two later conditions changed completely we're going around um cape colville like quite a gnarly stretch of water wind against tide and hectic like heart in your mouth and we were like 150 or something ah. just like that go crazy yeah. and we we're both sitting there like oh <laughs> it's hectic yeah and so then you start looking at things. like speed over ground like oh wow look at that yeah, look like, how fast yeah, yeah. we're going your watch is tracking that but it's crazy that i can't leave the house without this mm. and i can't dive without it now so it's a little bit bad because I know if this buggers out, there's only got like 14 days life in it. If it buggered out and I'm drifted out to sea, what am I going to do? Oh. You know, like this isn't going to do much else for me. Mm. Um, well, if you well, don't know the could environment, could save your life. Well, that guy down. Oh yeah, it was his watch, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah it was his, his watch. Life. But I'm just thinking about like if you had no watch and you're yeah. so used to a watch. Yeah. Do you know how to get yourself out of those situations yeah. that are dangerous? Don't become like, reliant. Yeah, 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 don't become reliant. So I do find sometimes when I do dive without a watch, I'm like, okay, sweet. You know, I think I'll be able to get myself out of trouble sort of now. Mm. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. Technology. Technology, man.
Thank you so much, gentlemen. Yeah. That was cool, man. It's nice how it flows. Yeah. With the cool people. Yeah, man. <laughs> give us a give us some info on, on how to find you guys, how to follow Coasty Kids, and yeah, please, brother. Oh, we have a few social media handles. Um, Coasty Kids is spelt with two Ds, uh, not one D. But yeah, Coasty Kids, um, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, all the same. Um, TikTok's your, your more funny stuff, I guess. Yeah. And then... Um, yeah, our website's up, but um, at the moment, yeah, we're just trying to go with the flow, keep our kid, you know, stay around our kids, and um, just pay attention to our mental health and everything else. Nice. But yeah, that's where we find us. Is the merch up for people to buy at the moment? Yeah, there's some merch up there. Um, you can definitely buy stuff for kids. Cool. <laughs> but yeah, um, there's no. Oh, we've got tail ponchos and stuff up at the moment, and um, some baby stuff. I think. Yeah. Beautiful. Hey, bro. How long? Fuck, <laughs> 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 that's an inside joke. <laughs> but um, how long did you, like, how was the first time, like... The, mean, longest. the longest. The longest time you got far from the sea. Like, do you remember a moment, like, you were like, oh, I cannot see the sea for that amount of time, or you always close to the sea? I've always been close to the sea. I've never lived anywhere that's not within... 15 minutes of the sea like probably the longest i've been away from being able to view the ocean is probably about a week wow yeah i was brought up pretty much on the ocean yeah so it's yeah that's definitely a good question because that's funny because like in, we came from a place that normally is like two hours at two least two, at least but some people stays like 30 years without yeah, their whole sea. lives they don't oh. see yeah, the right. sea they, they yeah yeah do you get wanna, itchy though like Oh. You're like me, like you, you can't actually last long away from the. You know what? I it go is? to Auckland for a day and I need to come home. <laughs> you know what it is that I get itchy for? Kinna. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not the sea. Kinna. Fat kinna. kinna. Yeah. Fat Just any kinna. kinna. It could be skinny ass because I'm eating the guts and all now. <laughs> yeah. Maybe a possum soon. Yeah, yeah. If you could choose one seafood, bro, for the rest of your life, kinna. Oh, don't put me in that position. <laughs> that's very unfair to <laughs> seafood. The question. Yeah, that's pretty hard to answer. But um, yeah, I would say it'll be kin of the muscles. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Could say. Yeah, yeah. The muscles definitely when they're fat and white and fat and orange. I yeah. love yeah. muscles. Nice. <sighs> yeah, but yeah, that's, that's the only thing that caused me back to the sea. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure I can. I've got tinnitus. But it reminds me of, you know, tinnitus, you know, yeah, you're losing yeah, your hearing. Yeah, yeah. But when it's clicking, it sort of reminds me of the ocean. Underwater, you can hear that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. underwater, you can hear that clicking. Yeah. And I'm like, sit there sometimes, like, the tinnitus goes off. I'm like, oh, must be time for a dive, you know. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's that mad diver thing we talked yeah. about earlier. There you go, kids. <laughs> ah, yeah. Great. It's going mad. Thanks, brother. Cheers, Appreciate man. it, man. Thanks, Thank Sean. You for me. That was Thank cool, you. man. Yeah, it's it good nice. to catch up. Yeah, man, hard. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. Funny nice. place to catch up. I think that you guys is. didn't mention, but uh, how did you meet? I slipped on his floor of his shop. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, funny timing because it was they went right hunting. before COVID. Yeah, yeah so, we were going hunting. Oh, can I just quickly touch on that? Yeah. So he, he, him, he turned up with a whole lot of boys from Coromandel to our house. COVID was around. We just had a newborn baby and Jules was like, oh, we're coming. And it was like a couple of days before he warned me. Mm. And I was like... Uh, we've got a newborn baby and we're quite precious at the moment. Okay, um, you can sleep on the floor of my shop at Coasty Kids. And so... We did. Yeah, they did. They did. But they went hunting and then we told them about the lockdown and then they're like, oh, d you, did you go back in? Yeah. You guys went back in? <laughs> yeah. And they're like, oh, it's all right, we'll just stay out here. And then someone we got... got heaps a, of rice. Yeah, someone got a text, eh? like someone got a message. Yeah, we found a spot for a really big deer yeah. and then the spot we went to watch from that had reception... Damn it. And we got like, yeah, the other lads had wives or partners and it was like, basically, you have to come home. Yeah, like it's illegal to hunt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's actually We're illegal. We're going to get too. Cool. Yeah. And I remember Jules coming back. I remember seeing him again. He's like, oh, man, I'm so gutted. I would have just stayed out there. <laughs> a few of us wanted to. Like, there was a vote. That would have been cool. Oh, did you guys put it to a vote? Yeah. Man, you guys are crazy. I was thinking, man, you guys are crazy. We don't might come, still be there. Don't come back to my shop. You're going to get me arrested. Yeah. That's <laughs> no. classic. What a way to meet, eh? Yeah, that was a way to meet. Yeah. And that was like, right, like, funny, the chat we had, he was talking about the start of his business and he got his shop. And Yeah, we only yeah. just started that. I remember you being like, you guys are a bunch of white boys from, from yeah. Coromandel. Just be careful. We're going to lock this place down. <laughs> like, I fully locked it all up. We're like, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. okay. <laughs>
Yeah, that was crazy. Mm. That was crazy times. No, it was good to catch up, man. Yeah, it was. It was cool. Yeah, nice. Thanks glad. for having us. Thanks for sharing. Thanks for sharing these stories. Thank you, guys. So once again, Lot of Love, Plant Based. Make sure to check uh, Tanya's social media and her websites, lotoflove.co.nz. JT, could you pass me your, your painting, brother? Please, I just want to say thank you as well for the beautiful artists and the people that support our show. Sean, if you don't mind passing me the, the, the bunny. Well, yeah. Quarter Mind Magazine, the Flock Media Group puts it together. Community Magazine, always supporting local artists. So if you want to get on board, coralminds.nz. Our bro, JT, very prolific. If you are listening to our show in one of the audio platforms, just quickly go on YouTube, man, and run to the end of the show on Facebook just to see this beautiful piece from our bro, J. A little bit more T. to your right, please. To my right. And no, that's the, that's not, sorry. The other that's, way? Yeah. <laughs> that's cool. Can people hear you talking to? Yes. Game, oh, they do. Oh, this yeah. is amazing. Unfortunately. So shout out to so cool, JT and That's the beautiful so artists that uh, support Alt Base and Coral Minds. As you guys know, we love uh, getting involved and in chatting with artists and beautiful people like you guys who are doing cool stuff. What's that moho in the thing? Yeah, bro. Yeah. Oh, it's moho here. Yeah. What? Shout out to Moho, Tamaiti's grandson. And that's Tamaiti. Came to our show and Tamaiti. Shout out to the Fano. Welcoming Fano uh, welcomes us in Waitangi in their campground. That was pretty cool. That's cool. If you get a close up on that, it is. There's some it's little mean, things in there. The details. details. Yeah. We're going to yeah. do some, cool. uh, some cool posts today and everything about this. If JT allows us. If JT allows us to do. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're yeah. out of here. Back next week. Enjoy your school holidays or whatever you celebrate in. Peace. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.